Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Having a good Thursday evening on the internet? Good. What's up, Jasmine? I see you. Thank you, everybody, so much for um, joining us tonight. I'm going to get started, and folks are still going to come in through the through the um, the waiting room. Um, my name is Kemi Adeyemi. I am an assistant professor of gender, women, and sexuality studies at the University of Washington um, in Seattle, and I am the director of the Black Embodiment Studio. You know, which is bringing all of you together here today. So big virtual welcome to everybody who is here and everybody who will be coming into the room. Um, I'm really excited for this conversation, for the fall 2020 conversation between Alana harris Babu and Jessica Lin. A quick note that this conversation is being recorded um, and that the recording along with the transcript will be available on the Black Embodiment Studio website, uh, which is blackembodiments.org. Uh, if you're a Twitter user, we have a brand new Twitter thing as of like two hours ago. Um, it's at BES underscore Seattle. Let me just drop that in the chat. Um, the Black Embodiment Studio is a hybrid arts writing incubator and public lecture series that is dedicated to cultivating rich, complex discourse around contemporary Black art and artists. So basically, we believe that you cannot have great Black art without great writing about it. Um, and so we're training people to develop their arts critical and arts writing voices. And then we put them in direct contact with Black artists, writers, and curators who um, really skillfully navigate the relationships between arts production and arts writing. Um, and this year, you know, everything is sort of different in the pandemic, right? So this year, we're experimenting with more directly supporting Black artists and writers. So we're commissioning new work and new writing from each of them, and we're asking them to be in conversation with one another. Uh, so tonight, I'm really excited to present the first in these pairings. There will, there will be three over the course of the year. Artist Ilana harris Babu and critic and writer Jessica Lin. Um, Ilana has been hard at work on a new piece titled Long Con, which is currently on view at the Jacob Lawrence Gallery in Seattle. And Jessica is in the process of developing two pieces of writing about this work and about Ilana's practice more broadly. Both of them are also working on other projects that we're going to hear about in just a minute. Um, this is the fourth year of the Black Embodiment Studio just doing the straight up work of simply training and funding arts writers to do right by Black artists. And it's our fourth year of directly impacting the discourse that surrounds Black artists. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of people to thank um, and for who make this work possible. So I want to just give a shout out to Dean Catherine Cole and the Jacob Lawrence Gallery and the School of Art, Art History and Design at the University of Washington for making this programming happen and for always being such great advocates of the Black Embodiment Studio. And I want to thank the BES public programming intern, Sadaf Sadri, for doing a lot of last minute grinding to make sure this conversation could happen tonight, so thank you all. I'm just going to give um, some short short bios, and we'll we'll get into the conversation. Ilana Harris Babu's work is interdisciplinary, spanning sculpture and installation, and it's grounded in video. She speaks the aspirational language of consumer culture and uses humor as a means to digest painful realities. Her work confronts the contradictions of the American dream the ever unreliable notion that hard work will lead to upward mobility and economic freedom. Jessica Lin is a writer and art critic. She is a founding editor of Arts.Black, an online journal of art criticism from Black perspectives. Her writing has been featured in publications such as Art in America, The Believer, Bomb Magazine, The Nation, Freeze, and elsewhere. She is the recipient of a 2020 Graham Foundation Research and Development Award and is currently at work on a collection of essays about love, faith, art, and the US South. I'm really excited to be in conversation with these two tonight. They're gonna to begin with short presentations that sort of introduce us to their work and to what they're working on right now. And we're gonna open it up to a kind of open conversation after that. I have some questions uh, to get us talking, but please feel free to use the chat function to think out loud with Ilana and Jess. Uh, we'll be following along. So if you have direct questions, we're gonna be pulling those out and, and posing them. So drop any thoughts, questions that you have into the chat and, and um, it'll be like a holistic conversation between all of us. 
Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ilana. Hello, uh, thank you so much for inviting me again. And it's really such an honor to be able to be in conversation with you all and with Jess and um, I'm gonna share my screen now. Um, yeah, and thank you so much, Emily, for inviting me to make, to show this new body of work with you. Um, uh, it's been really interesting, like working on this new project because of all the things that are so different about the world, of course, but also about the process of like kind of iterating and coming up with ideas for a place that like, you know, I've never been or I probably won't visit the show physically. Um, and so I've been working in a way that's really different from my kind of normal practice. Normally, um, like Kemi said, I kind of deal with like what I think of as aspirational media. So home improvement shows or cooking shows, uh, like things where there's sort of like a host who's um, sort of winning or succeeding and surrounding themselves with the things they've bought and they've made. So I'll be sharing um, in the show two older works that kind of fit in my earlier paradigm or process of working. Um, one called uh, Reparation Hardware, which imagines a kind of uh, restoration hardware style furniture store coming up with a new line, which is in fact reparations for Black Americans. Um, and the second piece I'll be showing is a piece from earlier on in the year before COVID that I made with my mother that where she kind of does like a sort of absurdist beauty tutorial um, based kind of on like the sort of Vogue influencer uh, YouTube things you might see. Um, and in that piece, I was looking a lot at wellness culture and I was thinking about sort of scams within this, right? Or the scamminess of something like Goop, right? The space of imagination or sort of making things up. Um, and in particular, in the context of that piece earlier on, I was thinking about who gets to be well, right? Who, what does wellness mean or clean eating, things like that. Um, and then, so my ideas, obviously, like all of our ideas sort of like um, started to shift and merge. I was still thinking about health and wellness and kind of making things up, um, but I started to think about this con in like a more sort of brutal, visceral way uh, in terms of the body and the black body in particular. Um, uh, in early March, my, two of my mom's cousins passed away from the virus, and it felt so much like it was about context, right? Just, you know, two older Black folks uh, in Queens in New York City at this moment in time. And so I started to think about what does it mean to be a scam when sort of the whole structure you're in, right, is a kind of a con. And so I started making this piece based off of some of my favorite sort of like con artists. Um, so uh, Miss Cleo being one. Um, and Dr. Sebi, who some of you might be familiar with, he's like a kind of a, um, a guru who passed away in 2016, who's kind of shrouded in conspiracy theories, including one that uh, implies that Nipsey Hussle was murdered for making a documentary about him. The idea being that like Big Pharma kind of doesn't want you to know about his diet, which is a kind of a, um, a, a vegan diet based off of really specific foods. Um, and his kind of organizing principle is that these are, um, that black people are kind of taken out of context, right? We're not where we're meant to be. We're not eating the foods we're meant to be eating. And if you just take his supplements and switch your diet, you know, you'll be healed. Um, and so he he's known for having gone to court against um, the New York State Supreme Court uh, for having claimed to have cured AIDS. Um, but then I started to think about these kind of larger structures, right? These other scams that have gone on, these swindles, um, like the Tuskegee syphilis trials. Um, and I started to imagine like, what if like Miss Cleo was like sort of divining what happened to uh, Dr. Sebi? So I got her um, tarot power deck uh, and uh, which is really fun. And I started playing around with those cards. I don't really, even um, know anything about tarot. So it's been an interesting experience. I love them because they're these kind of like Afrocentric, like uh, ancient Egypt themed tarot cards and deck. Um, and so the video that I'm making is like mostly made out of appropriated footage. And it's almost like in my mind, like a collage of a video. So very different from kind of acting in my videos, which I've done in the past. I'm sort of like 
stringing together histories um, just in real time on the surface of the screen. And I made these collages that are kind of based on the tarot cards that have an, a sort of alternative timeline of like the relationship between like our bodies and like the pharmaceutical industry, larger kind of uh, governmental conspiracies, um, and then also just moments in the lives of these two figures, two really human uh, like figures who fail and succeed um, and who in some ways, you know, you feel both dubious and um, in admiration of. So hopefully these will be printed and kind of go across the wall of the gallery along with a multi-channel video, which I'm gonna keep a little bit, you know, you gotta go there and see it. So I'm not gonna show you the video right now, but I'm gonna show you uh, some clips of things that are going to be in the video, um, quotes from Dr. Savi and Miss Cleo that I really find um, exciting. I made a statement that I was gonna do something to help humanity. But when I made that statement, I also knew that I was going to come up against the established or prevailing philosophy of life. People have been criticized and jabbed at and talked about throughout the ages for having different beliefs. And apparently I am no exception. I live different. I see different. I feel different. Skeptics now worry me because me, I know what I know. Me, I know what I believe. You understand me? They're the ones that get nervous after me, I pull everything out of their closet. Although it is a constant challenge, I will continue. I will not allow them to stop me. I will teach and help those who seek the knowledge. So, yeah, so I'm really like thinking about these kind of alternate stories we can make up or maybe also self-determination through kind of health um, specifically, but also this kind of imaginary space somewhere in between um, an alternate history where maybe we are where we're meant to be. Um, yeah. Thank you, Jess. Hello again, everyone. I like Alana, I'm really happy and honored to be here and really thankful for the invitation, Kimmy. It's great to kind of be in conversation and dialogue with her. I am also going to share my screen with you all. I have a short presentation. Um, okay. So I've been thinking a lot in my writing practice about the function of intimacy. Um, partially as a re response to a particular type of exhaustion I was feeling as a critic, um, and partially as a way to kind of rethink my relationship to imagination and storytelling. I wanna kind of talk about intimacy as something that serves both a political and an aesthetic purpose. Um, I've recently been reading the collected work of the late uh, Jill Johnson, who was a critic for The Village Voice, um, in the 60s and the 70s, and she has this essay in which she talks about how criticism is wearing her out, um, and it's like kind of running an uphill race with an invisible um, judge. And I think in, when I reflect on kind of the past few years of my work, there was certainly a moment when I was feeling really exhausted. Um, so intimacy, as articulated particularly by um, Black feminist writers that I find myself in study, um, became this way to kind of like move around that and circumvent what was becoming, for me at least, um, a disinterest in my own work in the page. And I think for those of us who have a creative practice or a practice that we treat as like a discipline, like a technical craft, I think we all experience those um, moments. And so intimacy becomes for me a way of pushing through that. And I think out of that, uh, methodology, if you will, the question about what criticism can do emerges for me, right? So how can we understand critique as sites of intervention? I think if anyone flips open a kind of mainstream quote, quote unquote, mainstream art publication, or perhaps even um, kind of a pop culture lifestyle magazine, it's no surprise that there are certain people who write um, about cultural production and there are certain people who do not. 
And this question is both connected to intimacy and is deeply connected to the work that I'm doing as co-editor of Arch.Black um, that I co-founded almost six years ago to the day actually um, with Taylor Aldrich. And we were really trying to think about within the wider conversations of equity and the nebulous terms of diversity and inclusion, where does publishing fit, where does criticism fit, and for our case, kind of how can we understand the role of the Black critic within that context? And so Arts by Black is a little screenshot of our homepage um, emerges from those conversations and negotiations, right? That I think the art world circa 2014, when we were kind of first emerging as a platform, is really trying to be thoughtful. And you see this conversation happening alongside the movement for Black Lives that is kind of really growing nationally and internationally, right? And the art world tries to do this thing where it wants to participate. And in many ways, it gets a lot wrong. Um, and one of those voids that we were witnessing was the implication of criticism within that conversation. Like you cannot tell a story, an honest story about cultural production, art, music, et cetera, if you are not honestly telling a story, an honest story about black folks. Um, and that story is not honest if black folks don't have an opportunity to tell that story, right? So our Stop Black comes to life um, in this way, first as a Tumblr page in which we commissioned uh, the black British writers Rihanna Jade Parker and Kareem Reed to kind of open up the conversation. Um, and they were responding to this question of where are all the Black art critics? Um, Taylor and I were using that question both as a rhetorical device and as something to shame because we knew where they were. They just weren't being published. Um, and for us, our Stop Black is um, and hopefully will be a really important editorial container for that writing just as it, as it is a really necessary archive of work that is both being made today um, by contemporary artists of all stripes and being responded to by Black artists um, within the diaspora. And so kind of in keeping with this impulse of intimacy, I wanted to really take a moment to explicitly call out and really thank and lift up the work of Black feminist writer Barbara Smith this essay toward a Black feminist criticism that was first published in 1977 is the essay that I began to revisit in this moment of exhaustion and kind of hunger for different types of imagination within my own work. Um, Barbara Smith is seminal, I think, to kind of Black feminist studies. And this essay really, at the time, is articulating a need for critics who are responding in particular to Black lesbian literature, right? That they are not there. And when they are there, we are either kind of dealing and contending with the um, patriarchal, perhaps um, over emphatic black nationalist uh, imaginations of black male writers. We are either dealing with the kind of paternal paternalism um, of white male writers, or we're kind of doing this dance and choreography with white women writers who think they're getting it right. So Smith asserts that like actually none of y'all are getting it right. And there's an entire conversation that black women writers and other non-black women of color writers can have and should be having. And when I revisit this essay, it for me really kind of does something new um, in a way that it hadn't done pre previously. And so I really wanna kind of lift up and encourage folks to revisit it um, if they have an opportunity to, to, or read it for the first time, because I think that it is one of those texts that kind of really stakes a claim into conversations about why Black critics matter. Um, so I wanna kind of put this question out there, right? That if we, we're talking about intimacy, we're talking about critical intervention, what does that lead to? Um, and I think for me, it leads to a real sort of uh, rigorous consideration of Black women artists. Um, I'm thinking about what it looks like to document work in real time. I'm also trying my best to think about what happens um, when these gaps exist in archives and how criticism and the work that I can do can kind of circumvent that and prevent these gaps in, in archives and lack of documentation from occurring 10, 20, 25 years later. Um, it's a way of placing intellectual frameworks around these artists and it isn't to say that I'm considering or positioning myself as any sort of authoritative figure. 
I think intimacy requires a relationship of reciprocity. It requires a particular type of vulnerability. Um, and which is to say that there's a lot that I don't know. Um, at the same time, I think in the space of intimacy, you're able to be vulnerable together and you're able to kind of do this um, call and response that is quite lovely <laughs> to be frank um, and really refuses what I consider to be an antiquated understanding of criticism as this top down kind of authoritative stance. And the critic is descending and kind of telling you what matters or telling you why this work is not important, right? Like I think that there are a different set of questions and propositions that you're able to ask when intimacy is a, is a framework that's taken up. And so for me, um, what that looks like quite literally is a rethinking of where I was doing my work from. I lived in New York for a long time and towards, in the, in the process of like navigating a kind of exhaustion, right? Um, I also began to take up a new research project and that research project was pointing me back down south um, to the coastal south, particularly where I grew up in the coastal Virginia area. Um, and I think that this is also really important in the conversation of criticism because we see that there are certain centers, um, certain narratives, geographic, political, et cetera, um, that are prioritized. And I also wanted to do the thing of extending outward uh, beyond the place that I really care about. I think New York is so lovely and has its own kind of important, rich um, Black cultural history. At the same time, there are other sites that have their own <laughs> culturally rich Black histories, right? Um, and I wanted to be responsible to what I was kind of feeling as a call and taking care of what was coming out of my own backyard, so to speak. Um, and so that leads me to thinking about the work um, of Amaza Lee Meredith. Jazz for an Epic is a research project that is tentatively titled as all projects are until they practically get out the door. Um, but I really wanted to kind of think about the politics and spaces of Blackness and Southerness and queerness. And I wanted to think about the ways that like an intergenerational cadre of Black women artists allow us to do that. So this project has been anchored for the past couple of years um, by Amazali Lee Meredith, who is this, well, I should say was, but in spirit she is, right? Um, she was born in the late 19th century and she died in the 1980s. This is the photo you're looking at of her and her partner, Dr. Edna Mead Colson. Um, she was an artist, she was an architect, and she really kind of was transformative in Virginia, but I also would argue nationwide um, in kind of putting forth a modernist vision of Black female subjectivity um, as embodied through ar architecture as scholar Mario Gooden argues. And so Amazo anchors this for me, both as um, someone who is from Virginia as like a Black queer southerner. And I'm trying to kind of really think about what it means to take up these archives posthumously, right? What it means to think about an artist who was no longer able to respond to that work in real time with me, um, as well as ask questions about like what we might learn from these two women um, who never, to my knowledge as far, um, labeled themselves as queer or identified as lesbian, but very much kind of were moving in, um, in a space that allowed them to live openly and safely. And I will stop there. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. And you know, there's you you both have like big, rich practices, and I know you know trying to get it together in five minutes is is kind of there's never enough time. Um, I was really struck um, about something between the what you two were saying, whereas Jess, you've sort of introduced us to thinking about arts writing as a practice of vulnerability, as a practice of intimacy, but also maybe as a, as a practice of a kind of a, of a truth telling. And Ilana, we have you here like working on like scammers, or we could call them scammers in, in one sense, or we could call them truth tellers in another sense. I really liked how you said, you, you know, you troubled that idea. Is it a scam or is it a narration of an alternate other reality that we're like kind of in right in this moment? So you're both sort of thinking about truth telling, not necessarily the truth. We don't want to like get there, but like practices of narrating a truth. And I think that that's a really good point maybe to um, get you two to reflect on what it means for you to come together around your practices 
you know, the Black Embodiment Studio has asked you to enter into a formal relationship. You know, we want you to work together. We want you to think together. So it's in some respects, not necessarily that organic, but we're asking you to kind of be intimate with one another, be vulnerable with one another. So I'm wondering if you can talk, think about um, or talk about what, what it has felt like to go into this process. What is it like, um, what have you seen in one another's work that feels like a point of connection, whether it's truth telling or not? And how are you, yeah, just sort of going about this process of um, forcing a relationship, you know, for better or for worse? Um, I think it's like really so amazing to be able to be in conversation as the work is still sort of in a state of becoming. I think especially like in terms of relationship to like folks who write about art generally, oftentimes it's like something that's done or a show that's done, this finished project that's kind of fixed. I understand how it can be hard to write about a moving target, but sometimes then, you know, the conversation can feel like, you know, send me your artist statement and I'll like switch a couple of the lines around and then like spit it out again so I can meet my deadline or something, you know? But this is like totally not that, which is so exciting. Uh, you know, cause also just like making work can be really lonely too, right? You know, as an artist. Um, and so being able to uh, have a back and forth, uh, like to feel, um, to feel both seen in the space where it's like, I don't completely see what it is yet, um, is really valuable. I definitely agree with that. I, I've been thinking a lot about the function of the studio visit. And I know, I'm, I'm curious, I wanted to hear, I don't think we talked about on our first, our first studio visit, how you actually feel about studio visits. But I know for me, they have often been places where I've brought a lot of hesitation because I'm never quite, I'm never quite sure what the artist's expectation is of me, right? Like, is it this thing where they are kind of hoping that I come in, write the thing, put it out? Um, or is it a space where they are kind of welcoming a more measured, thoughtful, um, prolonged conversation? And for me, I think the latter feels much more aligned with how I work. Um, and how I'm trying to think about the questions that we ask of artists and what they make. So for me, this process is starting off in a way that feels quite pleasurable, right? That like we have time for the most part um, to kind of go back and forth to check in. And we also have quiet, which I, I think for me as a critic, I want to be able to be respectful of um, like what's happening in like the quiet of the practice. Um, and kind of have that be revealed to me in a way that feels um, natural and intuitive rather than what I think Alana was talking about, this kind of forced like, all right, go, I got 700 words, like give me everything now, you know? I am sort of, one of the kind of framing conversations, you know, we've done, we've, the three of us have done some back end work that you know is not necessarily visible to the Zoom. And the two of you have done back end work in terms of like, you know, I did ask you to have a studio visit. Um, and you know, it's interesting, I didn't necessarily think about maybe what are other modes that they could connect, but the studio visit just seems like such a kind of um, easy is the wrong word, but it, it does seem like the way that artists are engaged, you know, allegedly, like it's in this confined space of the studio visit and it is um in order to generate a certain kind of output output you know the arts writer is going to go have the studio visit like Ilana was saying extract information and and you know meet their deadline one of the back-end conversations that we were having was about the sort of traditional historical relationship between the artist artist and the arts writer and like in super broad strokes that on one end it can feel really extractive um, it can feel really like ego driven and it can feel really toxic and critical and not necessarily about um, producing a conversation around an artist. And on the other hand, it can feel like really um, just sort of sycophantic and the goal is to write something that pleases the artist, pleases the audience, pleases the arts writer, it gets published and it doesn't necessarily advance the conversation forward. I'm wondering what your two relationships are to 
the the dynamic the the role of the artist and the arts writer like um is that something that you were kind of trained to think about or is that something that you had positive or negative experiences with in either end of that role as artist or arts writer how do you think about what that dynamic um can look like uh what it should look like what its limits what its possibilities might be I really appreciate that question. Um, when I first started writing, you know, about six years ago, um, I felt as if I had a chip on my shoulder and I had something to prove. Um, and feeling that way in a very specific context of New York City meant that I was trying my best to kind of be everything to every artist. Um, I think a lot of those intentions um, on my part and the artists were certainly good, right? That there were folks that I felt um, really compelled to think about, but I was moving at a pace that was not sustainable at all. Um, and this isn't to say that I don't have a respect for folks who work at dailies or weeklies, because I think that work is rigorous and hard in its own right. Um, but I think on a personal level, I wanted to try to do something different, and that really meant a negotiation with time. Um, I wanted to think about the work that artists were making, especially Black women artists, but I wanted to think about projects that were unfolding, and I wanted to think of my own writing as a project that was unfolding. Um, and so there came a point, as I was saying, where, you know, I think I just sort of like hit a wall, hit a ceiling, and that conversation, especially as it happens in media, is completely wrapped up in market and economy um, and a certain type of saturation that occurs. And I wanted to pay attention to that impulse, right? So for me, I think that I have been trying to really be better at like listening to an artist's needs in, a most, in the most thoughtful way. Because sometimes the kind of studio visit as architecture isn't what is generative, right? Um, and that's important. And I think this question and kind of provocation to think about a different type of architecture is important. Like with this project, the long con, like I'm thinking a lot about like memes and the way that like internet culture kind of surrounds these two figures. And like, maybe, like, maybe there's like an ongoing like exchange of memes that we're like engaged in, you know, um, as folks who are on the internet, as people who both understand who these people are in pop culture. Um, Maybe it is another formal conversation. Um, maybe there are kind of other types of exchanges and other media that come into play. But I think for me, I really am trying to be, to be present in a way that doesn't force, um, force the hand of time and pace, right? And, and I feel like some of, some of that feeling is like intuitive, like you know when things are moving too fast. Um, and you know, I'm willing to be persuaded otherwise, but I think right now that's kind of like where I'm sitting at. Um, yeah, I think like also just maybe thinking of like the studio visit or geographies or like sense of connection to place. Like I'm from Brooklyn and I hadn't actually lived in Brooklyn for a long time until August. I was living in the Berkshires in Western Massachusetts since like 2017. And there it's like, you know, like I really was only able to talk about pe works with people when they were done and like down in New York. Um, and in my studio, like, you know, it's like you see, I didn't, I didn't see any other black people most of the time period living up there um and, and it's interesting because like when I was younger like starting out I thought maybe I wanted to like write about art like as the thing I did I like was an art history major too I wanted to write about black artists and I was doing both the theses the art and the writing and then I just dropped out mid theses of writing because I felt like I had too many voices bouncing out around in my head and now I have like almost a phobic relationship to writing about my work like it's the hardest thing in the world for me to write about my own work and so um I still you know do it sometimes because you have to like apply to stuff but um it really is like I feel like I make stuff the way that I do visually because I don't like know how to say it any other way um and I think I've been lucky to feel like I have to enable to have these like wonderful moments of connection with um, writers sometimes. I remember there was um, 
one writer named Cassie DeCosta who wrote a review of my show, um, Reparation Hardware in 2018. And I was actually just so moved by the, the way she used language in that piece where she used we, like to describe the experience I was like describing my work and also her own experience and also to like bring the viewer into that, right? Like that the black female experience was just the we of this article in the New Yorker, right? Which I feel like was such a like really powerful shift you know being so used to you know automatically being able to step into the shoes when you go to the met of like a um, 19th century french man right and you just accept that we but like so often like just feeling like you have to keep explaining yourself as a black woman um and so for me it's like being able to be around writers in those moments feels like such a gift because it's something that's on the tip of my tongue or on the tip of my pen that I really just never let out that way. Jess, did you want to add on that? No, I, yeah, well, yes, <laughs> I would like to add on to that and just say that that really resonates with me. I mean, I think what's also really lovely about this pairing, Kimmy, that you've done is Alana and I both have a relationship to Recess, the art space in New York. Um, I was a session artist, she was a session artist, um, and then I also was there in a full-time position, but was exiting as she was coming in to realize that project. And so I think that this also feels rather serendipitous in that way, that there's a chance to kind of come back in conversation um, that maybe couldn't have been possible what maybe two I guess two two years ago two and a half years ago now um and like that sort of serendipity is also something that's not lost on me that I kind of have a two-part question to that and one um is about and so to have in your head you know what do the two of you want from arts writers or from arts writing kind of broadly construed um and but that's on the table. And Jess, I'd also, I'd be interested in hearing you reflect on what's happened since Arts.Black started and where we're at now. And if you've seen any sort of like material or conceptual changes in how people think about writing about Black artists or how think, uh, people think about Black arts writers, um, just sort of give us a, maybe like a, if you could track a history, maybe a very, very recent history. Um, because I think that, um, you know, if the three of us have been having this conversation three, four years ago, it would be very different. And so, yeah, I'd like to hear both of your perspectives and like what you want from arts writing and arts writers and what a, a recent history of this might have looked like. Um, I think like generally, like uh, when I make my work, I imagine it like almost becoming complete at the moment in which it comes into contact with the viewer, whether that person's like an eight year old or a person who like writes about art or something like that. And I think like, in so a lot of ways, I don't really know what I want from writers. Um, I think like there's, uh, you know, sometimes if I read something written about my work, I like cry because it's so it feels so amazing to feel seen and then sometimes I feel so embarrassed because it feels so uh embarrassing to be seen <laughs> too reading something um like uh my last show I actually I couldn't bring myself to read anything anyone wrote about it until like a month after uh until like a month after um because of that um the way of like maybe it's like you can see yourself being seen and like if you see it too much maybe like at least for me I could like freeze so it's like I'm just so grateful for writers and I haven't really had to have that moment where I was like wow that person like really like misrepresented me like terribly like I haven't I'm grateful to have not had that moment once someone described me as nihilistic which offended me a little bit but besides that no well, I don't really have a question about this, but I, one thing that strikes me about your work, Ilana, is that um, it asks a lot of the viewer. Like, and so I was wondering to what extent do you anticipate that moment of spectatorship? Um, and maybe not say like shift your work or make adjustments, but um, how is that kind of floating hypothetical viewer, not even necessarily critic, but viewer, um, how does that shape how you go about the process of making? 
Yeah, I like to think that there are like a lot of different points of entry for different viewers or something to the work, whether it be like some people just vibing with it for the music or the colors or recognizing the music that I'm referencing because I often sample sort of music that speaks to say like black folk will recognize it and not other people. Um, or maybe the text that I'm citing or j just like the materials that there could be like a million different ways for someone to care or like maybe not care about a work that I make. Um, but oftentimes really in my head, it's like my friend or some like a, like a literal, like, you know, maybe five friends or something that's like kind of in my head the most when I'm like actively imagining where I'm going to put things. Um, I think when to your question, Kimmy, I first kind of want to say what I don't want to see in our writers, which is to say, this is the thing I hope I also do not do, which is to say that like I hate the regurgitated press release right and like that's a very real type of like thing that exists in the world and I'm sure it, I know it drives artists up the wall I it definitely drives me up the wall as a writer and as an editor um and so that is kind of like the top of the list of the no but then I think what I love and really enjoy are kind of questions that don't end up good or bad. You know, I think I'm interested in work. And when I say I'm interested in writing that does this, it means I'm also hoping that I do this. I really think about kind of what's working, what's not working in a project. Um, I'm interested in writing that is really trying to kind of get at a certain sense of interiority. Um, and that for me feels like it results in work that's most moving, um, work that's challenging. It, I, I feel like a couple of months ago, there was a conversation happening with regard to the profile and a lot of writers had many different thoughts that they kind of boiled down into two camps. But, you know, if someone feels really good about themselves, after reading a profile you've written, then you haven't written the thing that you needed to write versus feeling like a subject who is happy with how you rendered them means that you've actually kind of provided enough nuance, right, that they are able to kind of leave with this sense of pleasure. Um, and I found that conversation to be really interesting because generally, I don't know that challenging always means someone has to be feel bad about themselves right i think i hope to be a writer that can kind of point to things that are currently or not in the moment being seen by both artists and audience um so i feel like that's where i land around like what what takes the best shape for me as art writing um and i think the second part of that question kind of a, a history of Black writing. I mean, that's it's a one of hard question. I think Arts Out Black, I'm really proud of the project. And I think in some ways, we alongside other folks remind people that Black writers are important, you know, that like research is important, um, that form can be played with. And, you know, if I'm being honest, I certainly feel that there's a moment after the 2017 Whitney Biennial that kind of really spurs a different sort of conversation about where Black writers are in the ecosystem. Um, and that is a certain shift that I have kind of really seen um, with haste. I think it also means on the flip side that like Black writers can sometimes feel like they too are being exploited and things are being extracted from them. Um, and that isn't necessarily a net positive, right? So, I mean, this question is actually really important because it feels like a larger like task to think about like kind of how landscape has changed. But I feel like in the short of it, the 2017 Dana Schutz fiasco for people who know, they know, that was a moment, you know? And I think it was just like, yeah, it was, it was a whole thing. And for me, that certainly feels like watershed if I'm thinking about the past like five years. A big part of um, my goals of the Black Embodiment Studio this year and 
of putting you two in conversation is to really like wonder if the relationship between the artist and the arts writer can be organized around a certain kind of ethics or a certain kind of politics. Um, uh, you know, as you were talking about Jess in your presentation around intimacy and vulnerability. Um, and how can we do that maybe without tipping it over into, like I was having a conversation yesterday uh, uh, into sort of a nepotistic, you know, where you know your buddies and you're, you're just gonna be like writing and thinking on each other and you know, da da da. -da. Um, I'm wondering how you two might have been going into this dynamic, this collaboration as a collaboration or how you're thinking about the literal mechanics and specifics of the conversation that you two can have. I feel like we're still really working it out or it's still really forming. It feels like this conversation is a part of like a bigger beginning um, to what's to come. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I also would like to kind of shout out someone who I think is the model for me, um, the writer and curator, Lady Sasha Jones. I think that the way in which she becomes embedded in practice is a really beautiful example of what it looks like to take time seriously and pace seriously and also kind of really get underneath the questions that like artists are trying to ask. Um, but I certainly agree that like this is a part of that process for us um, and one that I'm really excited about because I have a lot of thoughts about what's unfolding. Well, that's, you know, let's hear some of those thoughts. I am curious, Ilana, um, from your perspective as an artist and as sort of the artist of this dynamic of the artist arts writer dynamic, even though Jess is an artist, you know, in and of yourself. Um, what um, I don't want to say challenges, but I do think it's a, it requires a different kind of critical muscle to talk about um, people working in performance and people, you know, working in sort of installation based performance and people who are working in modes of humor that you're working in that I think traditionally um, non black people do not take seriously as like a critical form. Um, like, so the ways that your work on scamming is drawing on humor and also drawing on like real life crisis management um, and forms of fulfillment that like only that kind of hustle can can kind of fulfill you. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about your perspective as an artist, like maybe how you've been like misinterpreted or your, if you have fears around people not quote unquote not getting the work or um, if there is a specific approach that you would want people to bring when they when they see your work and and write about it um yeah i mean i guess like the most like the thing i really want is for people to actually maybe spend time i think there's also like maybe i don't know maybe how we relate like journal like journalism and arts criticism and but definitely there's the thing like where it feels like especially someone's like a journalist they want you to explain yourself as like a black artist or young artist like really fast for them as like you as type and how do you sit in the type of the trend they want to say about the young artist who burns out or the black artist who does this and um and that feels like a very brutal sort of an interaction and then if you don't get back to someone then you can be the artist who didn't respond to requests for comment you know so like that kind of interaction is definitely one that sucks but th this kind of interaction feels like a, a wonderful also moment of accountability right where it's like okay like if someone whose work I really respect is going to spend time with my work like I can't be messing around you know like I, I gotta have um I I gotta have something to share that I feel proud enough about uh that um that like that like it like I really feel like they're won't be as many moments of misinterpretation if someone really is truly trying to spend the time with it. Well, sometimes I also wonder if the threat isn't necessarily misinterpretation, but I think that that question of time is really important. Um, so it's not necessarily a threat of misinterpretation, but um, just like not having the, the moment to see what's actually happening, you know, in our rush to consume a thing, to see a thing, let alone if we do have a deadline and we have to, to write it. Or in that rush of, you know, when you're, when you see something and you're excited to write about it and you want to kind of engage in it, even if it's only in the written form and you don't necessarily have access to the artist, but that like 
it, there's also a kind of lack of seeing that can happen in like your jubilation and you know the the question becomes what do you do to like move beyond that moment and reflect and like take some time with it I guess and so Jess I'm wondering um as you are working in like arts writing forms that do sort of require a certain kind of deadline often um if your work on this longer form book project is shaping how you spend time with art and artists um so how the book project and the process of doing that is maybe affecting the demands of your arts writing project process i don't know that it is just yet right like i think that the kind of formal boundaries of art writing still feel very formal um and i'm trying at this point not to conflate the two I think like the book project and the essays, they kind of loom over what's going on broadly, but I don't know that I see them touching right now. I mean, there is, uh, I think there can be a conversation about strategy in terms of like, if you're writing a collection of essays, do you try to publish those essays, you know, as we know that many writers do write ahead of time and then kind of come back to them and revise and aggregate later. Um, and that certainly feels like a type of strategy to me. Um, but I think because Ms. Meredith and Dr. Colson and some of the other women um, who will be a part of this project, I think because this project is also really deeply connected to the I, right? Um, in a way that doesn't always um, happen in the formal art criticism, that there is still a line between the two at the moment. I'm open to that changing um, and also like it doesn't have to if it doesn't make sense. Um, I also want to say to everybody, if you have questions uh, for Jess and Ilana, put them into the chat. Um, I have, oh, here we go. Let's just answer, ask this one right now. Would you both say that engaging on terms of vulnerability and intimacy refuse the rigid languages of visibility slash representation. Hey, Zion. Um, <laughs> yes, I think yes, for sure. Um, I feel that way because I think it's easy to kind of get up, caught up in their tropes that like all skin folk are kin folk, and we know that to not be true either, right? So, um, I'm also thinking a lot in my in this project to kind of consider and be considerate of the rigorous ways that Black women artists are working. I know that not all Black women artists will kind of, there won't always be a reciprocal um, response there. Um, and that there is certainly, when I think about kind of the world I want to see and like who I am as a political being, it means that like representation can never be enough and that a certain flattening of real deep conversations that occur when representation is the end goal, just don't, they don't fit into, I think, um, who I'm trying to be as a writer. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, I, um, yeah, I agree. I can, uh, yeah, I think I really hope that it works, uh, that like interactions can work the way you're describing too. Um, I think like, yeah, visibility and representation are our outcomes, right? And like, uh, and we really want want to be in a process and um, and not necessarily be so outcome oriented. I mean, I think there can be that exhaustion or feels like a pressure on, especially black people creating when all of a sudden everyone wants to have visibility. And so all of a sudden you have all these deadlines to meet for people like, you know, they're like, oh, we really want to give all the black people the visibility by like, you know, squeezing out all their labor right now and putting it on, you know, putting, putting it on our front page or something, you know what I mean? So um, I like those private moments that are just about process too, and not necessarily about outcome or like quantifiable things. Ilana, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about that in conversation with the new work. Um, you know, because I, I do, I am so curious about, um, you know, Miss Cleo, Dr. Sebi, and how 
they are also invested in processes. Like your, your wellness is a path. It's a pro it's a never ending process. Um, you know, that can be used for evil in terms of like extracting money out of people to like, you know, continue on that process. But I'm just wondering if you think how you might think about the conversation about vulnerability, intimacy, process versus outcome, as it might be playing out in your work itself. Yeah, I mean, I thinking about like the relationship between like the person on the other end of a hotline and the person who calls in and maybe like the viewer of a work of art and like an artist or something like that, or there's like this, um, uh, I mean, I think maybe I like called the Psychic Readers Network once when I was a child, but like didn't really stay on the line very long, right? But you like show up like wanting something to be, I think we like, when we go out to look at a work of art, we want it to tell us something about ourselves too. Um, and maybe it's, and I think in the best interactions, it's something where like we can be hopeful for, or, like embarrassed about. Um, yeah, and so I wonder too, like especially like, uh, Dr. Sebi, like, I wonder, he has a lot of, you have to tell him all your secrets to get the supplements in a certain way, right? That his big, he's big on curing impotence, you know, right? Um, and I remember there's like a Hot 97, like, interview, and the hosts are like talking about, like, I get lots of Dr. Sebi vitamins, and the first thing is like, bro, you're, you're, uh, you're impotent, you know, <laughs> like, the things that are revealed by going to seek help and guidance from someone. Well, I wonder, Jess, if you could also, if you could um, reflect on that, like, to what extent um, do you as an arts writer, or maybe should the impulse of the arts writer, um, how might we craft a relationship to arts writing that isn't necessarily about um, teaching the, the reader, like teaching the reader about the, the work that has been staged, or, you know, I'll just sort of like leave it at that. You're asking all the existential questions, can we? Um, and they're great. I really, okay, I really believe in the editor-writer relationship, and I say that because I think good editors are really important to kind of avoiding a certain type of flatness or kind of like didactic treatment, um, and editors can be problematic too, but I think when you can work with someone who is able to say, okay, you as a writer, you are carrying a certain set of questions that matter to you um, and you bring those questions to how you think about and see art. You can't always ask every question in every assignment, right? Um, and I think that that relationship in particular is rather understated and underestimated in kind of what a final piece can do in the world, right? That like, I am nothing without my editors and I certainly feel like there's this yeah there's this impulse to resist flattening resist um and kind of one-dimensional read and if I don't see that I'm doing that in the drafting process like I really feel like a good editor is like hey girl like mm, this is this is actually not working right um I think absent that for me what has become really important on a practical level is just having a group of people to read my work, right? Um, you know, that I understand Black artists are not one thing, nor are they all the same. And if it feels as if, like, the work is, the writing is pandering to that, having, like, just a cohort of people who can help me workshop and refuse and remind me that refusal is good on certain terms right that that feels really important for me um because sometimes sometimes we make mistakes and having folks be it this kind of high level relationship with an editor and publication or either just like homies who read your work and care about you and don't want you to make a fool of yourself in public is also really important in the interest of not extracting too much of your labor and with the goals of ending a Zoom exactly 60 minutes after it started, I want us to wrap up, but I want us to do that with a kind of like parting thought from both of you on what, oh, this is the last moment of labor extraction that we're gonna, you know, now we're gonna really slot you into the role of teaching the masses. Your one liner about how we need to be supporting black art right now.
um paying black people money <laughs> yeah yeah so that part pay black people and pay them well and what they are worth i agree i love it thank you so much for having this conversation with and for us ilana harris babu jessica lynn we are going to be following your work if you're in seattle go see ilana's show go see ilana's work up at um, jacob lawrence gallery follow them both on the internets give them money and just keep supporting black art everybody thank you so much for joining thank us thank you thank you so much for having me thanks y'all this is great